Hello, so in this video I'm going to give you a summary of the bonding uh, topic in a National 5 chemistry course. So this would be useful for you once you've kind of finished all that stuff in class or you are someone who's taking higher chemistry for the first time. So there are generally three types of bonding in compounds. So remember compounds just where we've got different atoms joined together. In fact, these, some of these bondings can occur in elements as well for those elements that are diatomic and also the metal elements. So these are the three types of bonding we tend to find between atoms. Now, the first one, it's probably the easiest one, is metallic. So metallic bonding occurs between metal atoms only. So if you've got a collection of metal atoms, then they will be bonded metallically. And this is the diagram that's usually used to show metallic bonding. So we've got positive ions here with delocalized electrons all around the atom. So each one of these positive ions is an individual um, metal atom. So the description is given as positive ions surrounded by a sea, or sometimes you'll see it referred to as a cloud of delocalized electrons. And all delocalized means is that the electrons can move around that structure very freely. Okay. Um, as far as the bonding properties go, it's fairly strong bonding. So you, most metals do have fairly high melting points. There are some metals that have lower melting points, but in general, it's fairly strong bond. So you would need a lot of energy to break it, hence the high melting and boiling points. And metal, anything with metallic bonding will conduct electricity. It's a very good conductor and that's because the electrons are free to move. So to get any conductivity of electricity, you need electrons to be able to flow. You need a flow of negative charge because that's what electricity is. So ele electrons are negative. So if they can move, you get a flow of negative charge, which creates a current, an electrical current. And so you get conductivity. So that's the brief summary of metallic bonding. So the important things are uh, that you remember the diagram, recognize the diagram, can kind of pick out the definition and that you remember they conduct all the time. Okay. So then if we go into ionic bonding, so ionic bonding occurs between a metal and a non-metal atom generally um, and it's described as an electrostatic attraction between oppositely charged ions. So here we've got alternating positive and negative charged ions and they tend to make a 3D structure which is known as an ionic lattice okay? and that's when it's a solid. If you then take the ionic lattice, the solid ionic lattice, and dissolve it in water, that lattice structure breaks down and then the ions separate. So in your solution, you'll just have positive ions floating, negative ions floating, and they're all actually not electrostatically attracted to each other, so they're not totally fixed together. Unless the ionic substance is insoluble and then it doesn't break down. Um, however, because, uh, again, ionic the properties of ionic bonding is fairly strong bonding. So again, ionic substances have very high melting points. Um, they cannot conduct as a solid because there's no way for electrons to move around here. However, if you make a solution out of an ionic substance or you melt it, it will conduct electricity because, like I said already, that ionic lattice structure where all the ions are close next to each other like this breaks down and then the ions can move around and because you've got negative ions there the flow of the negative ions the movement of those ions will allow conductivity all right so ionic substances will not conduct as a solid but they can conduct if they are molten or in solution all right so then the last one covalent bonding so that occurs between non-metal atoms. So if you have two non-metal atoms joined together, then it will most likely be covalent bonding that's joining them. And here I've drawn a diagram of two hydrogen atoms uh, joined together. And covalent bonding is described as a shared pair of electrons between two positive nuclei. So in the middle of these hydrogen atoms, there's two positive nuclei that are mutually attracted to that shared pair of electrons. And the reason they share electrons is so that they can gain, obtain a stable electron arrangement. Okay, because if I cover up this one, that hydrogen now has a full outer shell of two. And then this one also has a full outer shell of two. So they're both now more energetically stable because they're sharing a pair of electrons. 
So when it comes to covalent bonding, in terms of the structures, it, it can either become a covalent molecule or a covalent network. And you should probably have seen pictures of these by now. Um, but if not, you can always have a Google of them um, and they'll come up. But covalent networks, if we start with them first, they are big massive structures where all of the atoms are covalently bonded to each other. Covalent bonding is extremely strong and because in these big massive covalent network structures there's so many covalent bonds between all atoms, in order to melt it you would need to put in a lot of energy to break all those bonds so it, covalent networks have some of the highest melting and boiling points you'll see um, in chemical substances. However, they do not conduct electricity at all because the electrons are fixed in the bonds. Um, so there's no electrons that are able to move. There's no ions available to move because there's no ions there at all. Um, everything's still neutral. So covalent network substances generally don't conduct. However, there is an exception to that rule and that exception is graphite. So graphite is a form of carbon and just the way the structure is, there's actually only three bonds between each carbon atom, so every carbon atom has one extra electron in its um, outer shell because it has four, so that those outer, one extra outer electrons are free to move around the structure, so graphite will conduct electricity. Um, the other covalent networks you generally see at National 5 are diamond, which is also another form of carbon, and then also silicon as an element, and silicon dioxide. So those are the main covalent networks you'll see um, carbon in the form of diamond or graphite and then silicon and silicon dioxide. Okay. If it's not one of those things it's, and it's uh, all non-metals, it's most likely a covalent molecule. So the covalent molecules are things like carbon dioxide or water where it's a few atoms joined together in a defined shape or defined molecule and you know exactly how many of each atom are, is in the molecule, so for example CO2, we know that's one carbon, two oxygens, H2O, one uh, oxygen, two hydrogens. Okay. Now, the, they still have covalent bonds between the atoms and those covalent bonds are very strong, however, when you melt or boil a covalent molecule, you don't actually break those covalent bonds, the molecule stays intact. What you are breaking are interactions or bonds that are occurring between the mo water molecules or whatever your covalent molecule is. So say I've got two, two water molecules, okay, when they are close enough to each other they will form interactions with each other and you'll learn more, more about what these interactions are in the higher chemistry course. But in order to change the state, so say we've got ice, so frozen water, Okay, the molecules are going to be right next to each other. Um, you probably learned this in first year, the states of matter. So as a solid, the particles are all packed and neatly arranged. If you then heat that up, the particles start to move apart and then they can flow over the top of each other, which makes it in liquid, like water. And then if you separate them even further, they move around separately and become a gas. Now, because the molecules are staying intact, to the interactions we need to break in order to change the state are not the covalent bonds in the molecule, they're actually uh, interactions that are occurring between the separate molecules and those interactions are comparatively fairly weak in comparison to the covalent bonding. So because when you're melting or boiling a covalent molecule you're breaking bonds between the molecules, they're actually, they actually tend to have very low melting points which is why the majority of them are gases at room temperature. So carbon dioxide is a gas at room temperature, nitrogen is a gas at room temperature, um, hydrogen sulfide is a gas at room temperature. Okay. So water is an exception and you'll learn why it's an exception in, the, in higher chemistry. But because you're breaking weak bonds between the molecules, the covalent molecules generally have low melting points. They do not conduct electricity though. And that's because again there's no electrons that are free to move um, so that's the general summary if you're trying to identify what type of bonding is occurring you just basically need to look at what the elements are that are in the compound so is it all metals is there a metal and a non-metal so if there's a metal and a non-metal then it must be ionic bonding if it's all metals it's going to be a metallic bonding 
if it's all non-metal elements, then it's going to be covalent bonding. Okay, so it's really as easy as that when you're trying to identify the type of bonding that's present. You're really just looking at whether the metal, uh, the elements are metals or non-metals. Okay.